We want to thank all of you for joining us today at Bethel Church. <clears throat> today we are discussing unity and suffering, or unity in suffering. Uh, it seems like there's a lot going on and um, throughout the world a lot of Christians are suffering throughout the entire world the gospel of Christ has fallen in disfavor never before have so many churches began to turn their back on Christ never before has so many churches began to teach the critical race theory and embrace that and so many churches are teaching the um, LGBTQTRSTUVWXYZ doctrine and they have embraced that with open arms uh, the next logical step is pedophilia and um, so when will a church start endorsing pedophilia well uh, Bethel Church is an independent fundamental Bible believing uh, dispensational church we rely on the King James Bible and we will continue to rely on the King James Bible. So many of you know that we have taken a strong stand publicly as well as privately. There are many times that we are laughed to scorn for uh, the things that we embrace and uh, you know what that's part of what what God is talking about today so we will be in Philippians chapter 1 once again we will start in verse 27 uh, God just keeps speaking to me through this uh, passage of scripture there's just more and more that we seem to be able to glean from this passage of Scripture. And uh, we're going to share it with everyone today. And we're so glad for those of you who have chosen to be here. And for those of you who have chosen to join us by YouTube. Or uh, if you catch us later in the afternoon, it'll be on Facebook. Uh, so... Um, we just want to let everybody know thank you for your participation. Now as we begin to read in uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which to them are evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege of being here and, and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and sharing that we should stay in unity with other Christ honoring Bible believing Christians and that we should stand together 
even in suffering, that we should support one another and lift each other up. And Father, we just thank you that you love us. We thank you that you sent Jesus to die for our sins. We're, we're, uh, we're not worthy to be called by your name, but you sent your Son so that when we believe in him that you can put your name on us. Thank you for that, Lord God. We praise you. I thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Now, Lord, I pray that you would put the gift of teaching on me today and that people would see and to understand uh, and that people would have the gift of learning today as they listen to the Word of God and it being talked about. Now, thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, we are ready to begin. And um, we will start. And, oh... As we go back through this, we'll do verse by verse. And we see uh, Philippians 1.27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Uh, some of you out there are letting your conversation drift. Uh, let me just make this clear. Uh, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. If you have the name of a Christian on you, and you have you wear the label Christian, and you're out in uh, wherever you are, and you've got words coming out of your mouth that are profane and vulgar and unnecessary. Uh, please let your vocabulary be enriched, and start learning some new words, and get rid of. Uh, the words that's coming out of your mouth. Uh, I see Christians reposting stuff that others have posted that's got curse words in it. And uh, let me just make that abundantly clear. If you are reposting stuff and you are posting stuff that's got curse words and you're showing a bad attitude toward other people, you uh, are not having your conversation as becomes a gospel of Christ. And you are, um, quite frankly, you are bad-mouthing God. And you're taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. It, you know, a lot of people think there's one certain word that you have to say in order to take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That is not true. If you are just living any way you want to live, and uh, that's taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. When you wear the name of a Christian, and you want to go out and fill your uh, mouth with liquor, and you want to go out and smoke your cigarettes, in front of other people and wear the name of Christ. Uh, if you want to continue to have curse words coming out of your mouth, if you want to show uh, anger and uh, discord, uh, you're taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. When you are op in open sin and you wear the name of Christian, you are taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain and the Bible says in Exodus that the Lord God, God will not hold you guiltless that takes his name in vain. So let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. So we need unity. And Psalm 133, 1 is one of the first instances of the word unity in the Bible. It's from David, a song of degrees of David. 
Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. If you wear the name of Jesus Christ, it is well in your purview to be in unity with your brethren. If you call yourself by the name of Christian and you are not in unity with others who uh, are truly born again, there's a problem with your uh, unity. Ephesians 4.3 says to endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So unity and peace go together. And uh, Paul is letting us know that in no uncertain terms. Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Ephesians 4.13 Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of fullness of Christ. Whether present or absent, the Apostle Paul wanted their conversation that is, their manner of life to be in keeping with the precious truths of the gospel. In other words, do not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Whether he witnessed this with his own eyes or heard it by the report of others, he wanted their testimony to be that, that they stood fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. You know, uh, there's one primary thing that divides Christians from non-Christians, and that is belief in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Through faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. Okay? So it's, it's by faith, it's by grace, through Christ, and uh, it's not anything else. No other form of works or any other thing gets us salvation into heaven. And if you are in a church that is teaching any other method to get you into heaven, or if they add anything to the death, burial, and resurrection, uh, they're not in unity of the faith. So... Uh, once again, his exhortation takes the form of encouragement to unity and oneness of purpose. The unity was to be reflected in their teamwork in proclaiming the gospel of Christ. So we need to be a team in proclaiming the death, burial, and the resurrection. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because of your sin, Jesus died on the cross. He was buried in a tomb and he rose again and that is your payment for sin. And when you believe in yourself and in your heart and in your spirit that your sin separates you from heaven and you turn to Jesus Christ and you believe on him for your salvation then you are justified and your name is written down in heaven. Some of you are living lives that are not glorifying Jesus Christ. Look, when a two-year-old throws a tantrum, tantrum, sometimes it could be funny. There are times when uh, two-year-olds are bossing their parents around and parents, you need to stop that. We need to have unity. When an adult throws a temper tantrum, there is never any humor about it. And uh, adults, please take note of that. Please, I implore you by the name of Jesus Christ, if you're throwing temper tantrums, stop it. We need unity among the body of Christ. Some of you have got some things going on in your life. Some of you have uh, 
as something has bugged you so much that you've turned bitter. Uh, I posted this little girl on uh, Facebook this week, and uh, she just got a darling little face, and she's holding up that finger, and she's saying, in this picture, never trust your tongue when your heart is bitter. Hush until you heal. Some people out there need to, to do just that. They need to hush until they get healed up. So let me just plead with you. Please, if, if you found that you have been saying, going off, you know, I used to get mad at the drop of a hat. And I found out for a while I was throwing my own hat down so I could get mad. So uh, stop that, please. Please remember to not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Some of you need to remember this. Don't be scared out of your determination to live out your heavenly citizenship by anything your enemies might try to do to you. Some of you are uh, cowering down to your enemies. Paul was saying their opposition to you is their own condemnation. Your calm collective courage in the face of danger and persecution is a sure token to your enemies of the perdition that awaits them. Got that? Do I need to say that again? Your calm collective courage in the face of danger and persecution is a sure token to your enemies of the perdition that awaits them. Philippians 1.28 And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of your perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Don't be terrified by your adversaries. Don't try to force your way on them. Don't be cowering down before them. Do not be terrified by them. God expects you to carry on in the name of Christ. God expects you to not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. We don't need to take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And please, when your adversaries turn on you and they throw the book at you, do not lose your cool and begin to use words that is unbecoming to a Christian. Some of you find something that you don't like and you just blow a gasket. And, um, you know, if you've ever operated equipment and you've got hydraulics and you blow a gasket, you're going to lose all your fluid. Some of you are spraying fluid everywhere. And you have blown a gasket and you're spraying the fluid out on everybody. And the world sees it. And the world is not attracted to it. And if you wear the name of a Christian and you're blowing a gasket on people, you're taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Your lifestyle is not in keeping with that of Jesus Christ. God's not going to hold you guiltless that takes the name of the Lord thy God in vain. We look to Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 3. And it's, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble. Neither be ye terrified because of them. You know, we as Christians should not be terrified because of those who stand against Christ. We who are Christians should not be terrified by those who 
are coming against us publicly in the public square. Our own government is beginning to come against Christians. They have had agencies, uh, there are agencies of your government here in the United States that has been coming against Christ and coming against Christians for many, many years. They've been slowly undermining the pillars of Christ. They've been slowly undermining and they've been promoting agendas. They've been promoting the LGBTQTRSTUV agenda. And pretty soon they'll be promoting pedophilia. And you need to understand this. Pedophilia is very, very real and it goes to the highest office in the land. And you need to understand that. You need to realize that. You need to take note of that. It's true. And that's just really the tip of the spear. It gets worse than pedophilia. Luke 2.19 Jesus said, But when you hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. For these things first must come to pass, but the end is not by and by. We've been hearing of wars and commotions for a long time, all my life. We had two world wars before I was born. The second one was completed before I was born. Luke 24, 37, But they were terrified and affrightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. Don't be terrified and affrighted because you've seen something. Some of you got spirits in your house. Some of you are seeing shadows moving around in your house. Don't laugh. If you laugh, that means you're afraid. You're afraid of what's going on. Yeah, I know some people that's seen things in the house and they're afraid to talk about it. And I know people that have seen and heard voices in their house. Uh, I had at one point in my life I lived in a house and I would was, would take a nap because of the hours I kept uh, I worked and I would awaken and I would hear voices as I awakened but once I would, came awake I couldn't find anybody the first time I heard it I walked through the house to find out where it was coming from there was nobody in the house. I was in the house alone. I then was awakened again at another time. And I started going around looking out the windows to see who was outside my house talking. And there was nobody outside my house. And I discussed this with my pastor at the time. And he said, I hate to tell you this, but I think you got demons in your house. And uh, I began to go through the house and declare the power of the blood of Jesus Christ over the house. And I uh, anointed my doors and windows. And I want you to know it stopped. There was no more. Whatever it was left. So don't be terrified. Just remember it. If you are a born again Christian and you know for sure that your name is putting in put in the Lamb's Book of Life. You have nothing to be terrified of. You have authority over anything that's going on like that in the spiritual realm. You are a spiritual being. And you have authority because you belong to Jesus Christ. Philippians 1 verses 29 and 30 For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him but also to suffer for His sake having the same conflict which ye saw in me, and now here to be true in me, or here to be in me. So, 
Paul looked at suffering for the cause of Christ as a boon. In other words, a profit is something that was good for him, something that, that he cherished. The apostle discounted privation and pain and prisons. He discounted persecution in the arena and on the cross by the sword and at the stake. He was saying to the Philippian disciples that some favored members of the body of Christ were being offered a privilege they could suffer for his sake. They could win a martyr's crown. To Paul, that possibility was not a prospect to be avoided at all costs. It was a privilege to be embraced. Suffering for Christ's sake was a gift of God, a gift not given to everyone. Unto you it is given, Paul said, as though some great advantage were being sovereignly bestowed by God. Paul believed this. Romans 8, 17 and 18. If children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. You know, Christians will go way out of their way to do things to avoid suffering when God has given you a gift to suffer for Him in His name. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul says your suffering is just a little tiny thing, but the glory that you're going to get is a huge thing. Peter tells us, in 1 Peter 3.14 But and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Now if you are suffering for taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain, that's not a good thing and you're not going to get any reward for that. But if you're suffering because you are living a righteous life and you refuse to give in to the, the norms of the day, Remember this, don't be terrified, don't be troubled, you should be happy. 1 Peter 5, 8, and 10, 8 through 10, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who has called us unto eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. There's a lot of benefits for standing for Jesus. I'm a fool for Jesus. Whose fool are you? Jesus said, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Christians should feel honored when they are chosen to suffer with Christ for their reward in heaven. Um, their reward in heaven will consummate with their sacrifice. If believers share in Christ's cross, they will share in his crown. Someone reading this commentary might just ask, Well, what about you? What have you suffered for Christ? I would have you to confess very little. I, I, I've not done much at all for Christ. I haven't. What about you? 
would you be able to stand torture and painful martyrdom? Well, I don't know. I trust that I would be faithful unto death. I would certainly want to be. Doubtless, God would give the necessary grace if the time of testing should ever come. Dying grace is for dying. Not everybody has dying grace because they're not dying. Dying grace is for dying, not living. Grace to suffer persecution is for those who are suffering persecution, not for those who are at ease in Zion. The man who was exhorting the Philippians had very every right to be heard on the question of persecution. As he remember, reminded them, many of them knew how he and Silas had suffered scourging and harsh imprisonment there in a Philippian jail. We can imagine that Paul's words were read. The jailer jumped to his feet. I testify that I am here saved and in fellowship and my wife and children too because of the way those dear men triumphed in prison and over pain. Some of you are not triumphed and over the bad things that you're hearing. Some of you are not triumphed and over what's going on in the world. Some of you can't even triumph over what's said about your children or your grandchildren. Some of you can't triumph over what's said about your brothers and sisters. Some of you can't triumph over any negative thing. You just succumb to it. Some of you are defending somebody and you blow up and blow on somebody else. And you're taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. If that's what you're doing, you need to check and make sure that your name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. And if your name's in the Lamb's Book of Life and you're doing that, you need to come before Jesus and be like the man who was on his knees and he was smiting himself on the chest and he said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Don't just say you're a sinner and keep doing it. Don't just try to give false platitudes about being a Christian and you just go on doing your own thing the way you've always done it. That's sin and God's going to judge that. Some of you are taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain and you need to watch out about what you're doing. You're you're just blowing up on people. If they disagree with you, some of you are uh, defending the Masonic Lodge. And you need to stop defending the Masonic Lodge. Because the upper degrees of Masonry are strictly into Satanism and demon worship. You need to get over that. You need to find out the truth and believe it and quit defending the Masonic Lodge. Some of you are defending people that you need to not defend. You need to let them stand on their own two feet. And when they stand on their own two feet, then they'll learn to do right, right by Christ. You can't get somebody else into heaven on what you've done. You can't keep people from failing before Christ for what you've done. Quit blowing up on people. God's not honored by that. There needs to be unity. And even in suffering, there needs to be unity. And we are just thankful that God has given us the ability to, to stand so far in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on in. So Paul was suffering persecution as he wrote his letter. If for the moment the prospect of martyrdom had failed, faded, it still remained a likelihood later on for Paul as a man who stirred up not only friendship but also hostility everywhere he went. 
So, uh, look, Paul's reputation preceded him. And everywhere he went, people already knew about him. You either loved him or hated him. And some of you that, that hated him, some of the ones that hated him got to listen to him. You know, have there ever been somebody you don't like? And then you uh, heard something they said that got your attention? And then all of a sudden you begin to uh, start thinking about what they had to say? Uh, I'm going to tell you something for sure. There's been some Christian men that, that I thought they were just plumb goofy. Some preachers. And then I began to listen to what they had to say and I began to check what they had to say against what the Bible had to say. And I had to start reevaluating some of my opinions and some of my things I was doing. And um, remember this, you got to take the Word of God over our own personal opinion. And if you don't, well, uh, there's a, if you're a born-again Christian, there's the judgment seat of Christ. Y'all may be getting tired of hearing me talk about the judgment seat of Christ and an inheritance that's handed out at the judgment seat of Christ. Let me tell you something. In the Jewish customs of the day, a, a young boy was not a, the son until he had reached a certain age. He was under the care of a, a slave in the home or a, a servant in the home. And that servant, it was a servant's job to raise that son up in the way he should go. And the servant was responsible to the, the, the man of the house, the patriarch, it was a patriarchal society. You know, uh, we are living in a society today that the patriarchs have succumbed and given the, the responsibility to the matriarchs. And that's not the way God intended it. God put the man in charge. And it's his responsibility to see that things were done decently and in order. So, uh, it was the duty of the son to grow up. And then came the day that the son was adopted into to be the son of the, the, the dad, the father in the home. He wasn't a son until he was adopted. And some of you are needing to be adopted. You need to be a son. And the way you become a son is to believe in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ because of your sin. Some of you need to realize that your sin separates you from God. Some of you, look, some of you just go to church, and I've been in some churches, and at the end of the church service, they have a, a corporate prayer. The whole church prays, and it's, it's like a prayer of salvation. And it's a corporate prayer that the whole church prays and I think it's done to trick people into thinking they're saved. The whole church recites the same prayer every Sunday at the close of the service. And it's similar to a prayer of salvation. But the problem is there's people going to church that recites that prayer and they think they're meaning that prayer and they don't even know what they're doing. They haven't come to realize that their sin separates them from God. They just got a good, feel-good message from the preacher and they were liking what they were hearing and they didn't really get any gospel. But they liked it. They got encouraging words. But they didn't come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. So it's going to require repentance. And I know that a lot of people don't like that word because 
Some of you out there are doing things that you don't want to repent from. Some of you are uh, still being controlled by your anger. <clears throat> Some of you can't take it when somebody talks about <clears throat> anybody you know. You get all tore up if somebody mentions one of your family members. Even if it's true. Some of you get all tore up about a lot of different things. <laughs> okay, I guess I I guess I'm the one that didn't set my clock back. <laughs> We got people coming in. I guess I'm the one that didn't set my clock back. So praise the Lord. I got up early this morning. I'm looking at my phone. We took our that clock. Something wrong. And it dawned on me. It rolled back. Yeah. Here I am. I got ready. And I've been preaching my heart out. Nobody here. <laughs> so praise the Lord. Not too late, uh, well, I started at 11:30. <laughs> fast, fast time, Eastern Daylight Saving Time. I started at 11:30. Right the real time. The real time. It's uh, 10 after 11. 10 after. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, we're just going to going right after it. Should I begin again? <laughs> As we are, we're already started. We're well underway. We've been underway for 45 minutes. I'm sorry. That's all right. We're giving the close. <clears throat> so, uh, some of you out there are wicked lost sinners. <laughs> I ain't lost, but I am wicked. <clears throat> You're into the worst kinds of sin. Some of you are doing things that you ought not be doing. You're carnal. Some of you are just living your lives as, as carnal as you can be. You're wicked at the core. Uh, some of you are uh, getting on the internet and you enjoy things on the internet that you ought not be involved in. It's called pornography. And uh, some of you like to read wicked jokes. And you like, to, you like humor that takes the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You like that stuff. You can't get enough of it. You're not sorry about it. You don't have good works and you're not surrendered to God at all. Now let me tell you something. <clears throat> you can't change until you realize that you're lost. And a man who loves his sin will not choose Jesus. A man who does not recognize his sin separates him from heaven has little incentive to choose Jesus. A man must come to understand the seriousness of sin and its penalty. Let me tell you this, Jeremiah 13:23. Can an Ethiopian change the color of his skin? Can I, you know, don't don't be even go there with uh, me being uh, racist when I say read this verse of scripture. Because if you're white, you can't change the color of your skin. If you're black, you can't change the color of your skin. Yeah, you try. I used to live in Detroit. They used to sell porcelain of fade cream in all the black neighborhoods. They was built big old billboards everywhere with porcelain of fade cream. And all the, the black ladies, they wanted to get to be whiter. And all the white ladies, they wanted to go to the tanning beds to get darker. So, uh, you know, if just because you're not happy with the color of your skin, don't blame me. Can a le leopard take away his spots? Neither can you start doing good, for you're, you have always done evil. A man who loves his sin will not choose Jesus. You need to know that. Now, a man who begins to find out that your sin separates you from God will begin to think about the things. So, uh, a, a man who is like that has no standing before God whatsoever. And um, 
You need to understand that. And now comes repentance. You begin to have a change of mind about your sin and Jesus. Acts 10, 40. Uh, let's, let's read Acts chapter 10. Paul's sermon to Cornelius and his family. Acts 10, 34 through 47. We'll read it. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. <clears throat> that word, I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism was John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him, Jesus, God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to the witness chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that is he which was ordained of God to be judge of the quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remissions of sins. That's an important verse right there. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, Jesus' name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, and as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we have? All right. So repentance is the gift of the Holy Ghost. Look in Acts 11:18, and they heard these things, which uh, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, "Then God hath also to the Gentiles granted repentance to life." The question is, do you see your sin differently, or do you believe? Do you believe Jesus is who he says he is? Have you had that moment? That moment where you decided that Jesus died for your sin. That God is real. And then it hits you. You realize if you believe Jesus is exactly who he says he is, the risen son of the most high God, it changes everything. You had that moment? So as Peter spoke death, burial, and resurrection to the household of Cornelius, his whole household believed, and then they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So when you do that, you have standing. Right here. I even got that standing blinking up here for you. You got standing right there. You can go one, once you get here, you can go one of two ways. You can have a spiritual nature. You can begin to do exactly as Christ has commanded. And that is the state you're in. Or there are people who keep walking in the fleshly nature and they're carnal. Sometimes people walk with Christ and then they drop back and they're, they're carnal. They... Look, I know Christian people that's come here to church. 
and been good Christians in front of us, and right now they're out living in the world. Can I pack all this to get your attention? Somebody needs to hear this. There are people who are good, have been good Christians all over this place who have gone back out and they're in some of the worst sin they can get in. To be honest about it, if you tell a lie, that's no different than committing adultery. It's no different than murder. So, uh, some of you need to hear that. Some people somewhere need to hear that. I'm talking to somebody today that needs to hear that. There are people who are Christians who, you know what, they can Christians can get just as nasty and mean and hateful as anybody else. In fact, some of the people I know who claim the name of Christ are worse than some of the ones that don't. God told me one time, if you're going to do business with anybody, make sure you don't do business with people in the church because they'll cheat you quicker than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right. For those people that's living in the world, that's doing things they ought not be doing, that's the state you're in. You're either in a spiritual state or you are still got the old nature and you're walking in carnality and that's the state you're in. Now let me tell you this. If you are born again, and you don't start walking over here, and you're still, you're determined that you're going to stay over here. God will be obliged to deal with the fleshly nature. Colossians three five and six. Let me get over here, and we'll read these. <coughs> Colossians 3, 5, and 6. Mortify there your, for your members which are upon the earth. Fornication. Let's see. I lost my place here. <clears throat> Mortify your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. <clears throat> For which things sake of the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. First Corinthians eleven twenty seven through thirty two states clearly that if you take communion and you don't judge your own sin, that there are people who are asleep, and and that means that there are people who die because of that. So. Uh, the truth of it is you can, ju you can uh, judge yourself or you can just wait and let God do it. James 1.15 <clears throat> 1 John 5.16 and 17 James 1.15 We need to read that. <clears throat> who, uh, who knows who James was? James 1.15 That's right. James was the Lord's brother. James 1.15 Then when lust hath conceived and bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. <coughs> so if a person will not judge themselves for their own sin, God will judge you. John five sixteen and seventeen. John five. I'm sorry, first John five. I knew that was first John. I was just checking to see if y'all did. <laughs> First John five, sixteen and seventeen. 
If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. And I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. <clears throat> Alright, so... uh there is a sin and a death. The book of John was uh, written to Christians. 1 John 5.13 says, And these things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. <clears throat> Alright. So today, the question I need to ask, are you born again? Have you believed in Jesus? Do you have standing before God? Are you justified? Is your name in the Lamb's book of life? Are you saved? I'm using a lot of different words to say the same thing. <clears throat> Do you have standing? What's the state that you're in? Are you living in a spiritual state or are you living in a carnal state? So, uh, the question is up to you today. Some of you, some of you listening to this on YouTube or wherever or whether anybody <clears throat> need to understand if you haven't believed in Jesus Christ for your salvation you have no standing before God my question is this what will you do with Jesus some of you who are born again who are saved what are you doing with it What are you doing with it? Father, we come in Jesus' name to ask you to be with those who have listened to this. Father, we thank you for your word and for those who have trusted in you. <clears throat> we thank you for those who are under conviction about their sin. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>